Well, most of you know that my father, uh, Roland Coffey, was and is a pastor. Well, more than that, uh, he's always been a great dad, and for that I'm truly, truly grateful. But he's 82 years old, still part-time pastoring at my brother's church in Hudson, Ohio. So as I grew up, son of a pastor, there were three constants in my life. First, church. We were in church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and most Wednesday nights. In fact, I don't remember a Sunday my entire growing up years that we weren't in church. It's just what we did. Secondly, second constant was Jesus. One of the great blessings of my life is I don't remember a single day of my life that I, that I didn't know the story of Jesus and that he loved me. A great blessing in my life. And third, I was very aware of the expectations that came with being a PK, a preacher's kid. Now, my parents were careful not to heap those expectations on me. And I grew up in healthy churches, a lot like FBCG. But still, the expectations were there. And that will help you understand the story I'm about to tell you. When I was about in the seventh grade... Uh, We went to church as usual on a Sunday morning, started with Sunday school. And while we were in Sunday school, a kid named Billy Wright kind of whispered to us and got our attention. And he kind of went sideways in his chair and he showed us that he brought to Sunday school a pack of cigarettes in his pocket. Now you have to understand, this would be like bringing a kilo of cocaine into a kindergarten class in today's world. This was unheard of, unprecedented. I mean, I'd never even seen a real cigarette before when I was in seventh grade. After class, several of us buddies, three or or four of us, followed Billy out behind the church building into the parking lot, and he showed us his contraband. I think it was uh, Winston's. And then he took out some matches, and he said, come on, guys, you want to smoke them? Now, we were all good church kids from good church families, but we came to church that day completely unprepared for that particular temptation. We were scared out of our minds, but overwhelmed by curiosity and just a hint of rebellion, I think. And we bolted at the end of Sunday school for the far end of the church parking lot, hid behind behind some trees, and Billy lit up a cigarette with his matches. And with our hearts pounding out of our chest, we each took a puff. One puff. Pass it around the little group, and then we were immediately, this is really fun, the funny part of the story, immediately overwhelmed with guilt, all, all five of us. We put out the cigarettes, we buried them in the ground, we prayed a prayer of repentance and forgiveness and ran back to church. And for the rest of our middle school and high school years, that was our little secret. Sorry, Billy, <laughs> just let that out of the bag now. Actually, I've told that story at least one time before. Our year-long preaching theme is the story of Jesus, and our current series is called Preparation. We're in the preparation phase of Jesus' life. And last week, we looked at the beautiful story where Jesus was 12 years old and stayed behind after Passover uh, to be in his father's house, the temple. We saw that then he uh, went home to Nazareth with his family at the end of that story and grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now, most scholars believe that Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, died soon after that trip to Jerusalem because we never hear from him again in the New Testament Gospels. The assumption is that Jesus took over Joseph's business. He was a tecton, that's the word in Greek, it means carpenter or builder, and that Jesus worked in that profession until he was about 30 years old. At that point, he suddenly leaves the shop and goes to follow John the Baptist out in the wilderness and is baptized in the Jordan River. Uh, And then that brings us to the story I'm going to tell you uh, this evening or today. And I'm going to read this story through one time completely without breaking. So you hear the drama of the story. And then I'm going to break it apart and we're going to teach our way through it. So Matthew chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 1 through 11. You can follow your Bibles or watch the screen behind me. Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, 
You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Okay, now let's start over again and sort of take it apart and see what we have to learn. Matthew says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, Matthew says Jesus was led up, so which direction is he going? Remember from a couple weeks ago? That's right, he's headed to Jerusalem. Remember, he's been baptized in the Jordan River. Jordan River is located at a very low elevation. He's heading toward Jerusalem because Jerusalem was at elevation. So he's heading up into what's called the Judean wilderness. Now notice Jesus was led by the Spirit. Very, very significant phrase. He's just experienced his baptism, which Jeff's going to cover next weekend here at the West Campus. And when the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, and you'll hear all about that story. Luke tells us in chapter 4 of his gospel that following the baptism, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. So a dramatic experience in his life. And the next thing we see here is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, leading Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, the Judean wilderness was and is a very desolate place. If you could see it, uh, you would uh, almost immediately think to yourself, I really wouldn't want to spend one night out there in the desert, let alone 40 nights. Uh, it seems to be a place of loneliness, despair. There's nothing there. Nothing grows there. Stones and rocks and dirt and dust. Uh, why would the Spirit lead Jesus there of all places? But I want you to see that Jesus didn't necessarily see the wilderness the way we would see it. We see later in the story of his life and ministry that Jesus loved to go off alone for days at a time just to find solitude so he could find communion with his father as he prayed. He liked to go to lonely places, scripture will teach us, just so he could pray. So for Jesus, the wilderness was actually a place of prayer and preparation. So the spirit takes him there not to make him vulnerable and weak and afraid, rather to strengthen and prepare him for the great confrontation that's about to take place. Verse 2, and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. We know through medicine today that 40 days is right about the human limit to be able to survive without nourishment, without food, as long as you have water. We've seen hunger fasters and others be able to do that. We know Jesus had access to water. There's water trickling down out of the hills and, and through the streams. And for all we know, this is the only time Jesus participated in an extended period of fasting. In fact, later in his ministry, he's criticized because he does not teach his followers, his closest followers, to fast like some other religious groups did. But here he does, most likely because he's preparing for a very significant spiritual battle with his adversary. Verse 3, and the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now let's talk just for a minute about the tempter. Did you see the story a few weeks ago about the so-called satanic statue that was uh, set up as a piece of art in Detroit? Did anybody see that little story? It created quite a controversy. It was about a nine foot high uh, statue of a grotesque looking figure Big goat looking head with horns. Uh, you can look on the internet and find images if you want. I was going to put one up here, but I thought it inappropriate to do so. Uh, and it was unveiled as several hundred people looked on. It created quite a controversy. And I'm always interested in this kind of thing because that's often how Satan is portrayed in popular culture and art. You know, horns, pointy tail, pitchfork, wearing red pajamas, you know, obviously evil. But that's not always the way the Bible portrays him. In 1968, Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones wrote a song entitled Sympathy for the Devil. Some of you may have listened to it back in the day. It includes these lines. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. I've been around for a long, long year. Stole many a man's soul and faith. And I was round when Jesus Christ had his moment of doubt and pain. Made sure that Pilate washed his hands and sealed his fate. Pleased to meet you. Hope you guess my name. But what's puzzling you is the nature of my game. Now, I have no idea what Mick Jagger actually believed about God or Jesus or Satan. But I think he got this right. We don't really understand who Satan is and what he does. We don't really know his game. All we see is caricatures in our culture that make him into a cartoon figure. 
In his fascinating book called Screwtape Letters, uh, written by C.S. Lewis, and that, that actually tells a story. It's a dialogue between two demons. So you have to read the book sort of upside down. It's two demons talking to each other. C.S. Lewis says this, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to be- disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Matthew here refers to the devil as the diabolu in Greek and, to, and as the temp, tempter. The, the word diabolu we get our word diabolical from, but in much of scripture he's simply called Satan. Now that name itself means one who opposes, one who resists. The Bible refers to Satan as a, with a number of other descriptive names as well. For example, the adversary, the deceiver, the liar, the father of lies. The accuser, the destroyer, and the prophet Isaiah gives us just a hint into the origins of Satan in Scripture. In Isaiah chapter 14, we read this passage. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Most scholars believe this is a prophetic way of telling us the origins of God's great adversary. Satan was once an angelic being named Lucifer, an angel of light, who became proud and was then cast out of heaven and set himself against God and will one day finally be destroyed by God. We see that in the great book of Revelation. We'll cover much, much later in the story of Jesus. And since his expulsion from heaven, Satan's agenda is to steal, kill, and destroy, which is why Jesus says in John chapter 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. There it is. Jesus and his great adversary. Now, Satan is a mysterious being in Scripture, and the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot, doesn't explain a whole lot about Satan's activities. But we can know several things about Satan. First, Satan is real. Satan is not a a figment of someone's religious imagination. The Bible teaches Satan is a spiritual being. The Apostle Paul says he's like a, a roaring lion prowling about seeking someone to devour. Satan is real. Secondly, Satan is opposed to everything God wants to do in us and in the universe. Everything. The Bible says even now a great spiritual battle rages for every square inch of the universe. And that battle will not end until Satan is utterly and finally destroyed at the end of all things. We'll see that again in the book of Revelation. Thirdly, Satan is a very intelligent being. Satan thinks he's smarter than God himself. That was his his sin, pride. And he knows he's smarter than you and me. In fact, throughout the Bible, Satan behaves a whole lot more like a prosecuting attorney than he does a devil with a pitchfork. He argues, he convinces, he accuses, he reasons. He's an intelligent being. And finally, fourthly, Satan is also a limited being. A spiritual being and a powerful being, but a limited being. That is, Satan is not eternal. Satan is not omnipotent. Satan is not omniscient. That is, Satan does not have the authority, for example, to enter into your mind or your thoughts or your heart without your permission. He doesn't. He's a limited being. Even now, he is able only to attempt from the externals to tempt our sinful natures, but he's not able to enter into your mind and make you do things. He has granted certain freedom and authority to roam to and fro on the earth. You can find that in the book of Job. But his freedom and authority is even now being limited by God. Satan, left to his own desires, would destroy everything. Everything. But he's not able to because God even now is limiting Satan's activity. This is why the Apostle John writes in 1 John 4, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, the evil ones, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The Spirit of Christ dwells in you if you're a believer. Satan is out in the world, but he cannot enter. He cannot do anything to to the one who is living in you. One last thing here. How do we even have this story? I thought about that as I read it again this past week. How do we even have this story? There are only two characters in the story, Jesus and the tempter. 
his enemy. No one else. So how do Matthew, Mark, and Luke get the story to write about it? Jesus himself must have told them this story. So it comes from the Lord himself. Now let's look at the temptation. Satan says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. First thing I want you to notice here is that little word if. Satan loves to ask questions. He's intelligent. He's like a lawyer. He asks questions. He wants to create doubt. He loves to start with if. He's trying to attack Jesus here at the point of his identity. Remember, Jesus has just experienced this wonderful thing, his baptism, when he hears the voice of the Father say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Satan is saying, if that's true, if you are the beloved Son, how come you're starving to death in the desert? Hmm? How come he doesn't take care of you? How come if your father loves you so much, he lets you suffer? The same tactic he tries with us. If God is so good, then how come you lost your job? If God loves you so much, how come your loved one's in the hospital? If God is so good to you, how come you don't have everything that you want? And then he says, turn these stones into bread. He's hungry. He craves bread. His body craves bread. Some have said the landscape might have been littered with, with stones that could have looked like bread to a hungry man. So he's using the stones to leverage Jesus' physical craving. Now think about this. There's absolutely nothing wrong or sinful about eating bread. It's the simplest human activity. There's nothing sinful about that. There's nothing wrong or sinful about Jesus, the creator of the entire universe, turning stones into bread. He can do that. It's within his power. It's within his right. See, the temptation's not about eating bread. The temptation is about trusting God. Satan is questioning Jesus' faith in his Father. Let me change the, the illustration. Let's say you're a parent. You have a five-year-old, six-year-old son or daughter, and your son or daughter just really loves chocolate milk. And as a parent, you, you enjoy giving them chocolate milk because you see their pleasure. And, but you've had to establish a rule because you know too much chocolate milk wouldn't be good for them. And so you make the rule, only one chocolate, glass of chocolate milk in the morning, and I'll make it for you every morning. I'll give it to you, but I'm going to give it to you every morning, and I'll make it for you. One morning, you come down, and the child comes up to you and says, can I have chocolate milk? But you look at them, you can see the little mustache. You know, they have a clear chocolate milk mustache. And you say, well, did you make yourself some already? No. What's happened there? In that little situation, your little son or daughter has chosen not to trust you as their parent. They don't really believe you're going to come through, so they take a shortcut. And they do it themselves. Satan is saying, why should you, the son of God, the king of glory, he knows who Jesus is. Why should you, the Messiah, why should you ever be hungry? It's beneath your dignity. It's beneath your right. You have a right to bread. You, have a, you can create bread. You're entitled to bread. He's tempting Jesus to abandon his trust in his Father and to take a shortcut. Take this deal into your own hands. You deserve a break today. You're entitled to it. Just take a little shortcut. You know, almost all sin is about a shortcut. That is a legitimate need met in an illegitimate way. Need for money? Steal. That's sin. Need for intimacy? We're created with that. The shortcut is lust. You need food? Settle for gluttony. I need success? Cheat on a test to get a better grade. All sin is a shortcut. Jesus' response, verse 4. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus responds by quoting scripture. He's quoting Deuteronomy 8.3, which says, And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In other words, trust me. Jesus reminds himself of God's goodness and provision by remembering the promises of God's word. Next, verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Now the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D. by the Romans. And today the Islamic holy site called the, the Dome of the Rock stands where the temple once stood. But the foundation that's called the Temple Mount is still there. 
uh, and there are several walls that still stand that were part of the original structure. This is the southwest corner of the Temple Mount today. This is what you'd see if you went to Jerusalem. And in Jesus' day, the temple would have, looked, would have looked something like this. And there would have been a portico way up high on the southeast corner of the wall, overlooking the Kidron Valley below, roughly 450 feet above the ground level. Okay, that's probably the situation where Jesus was taken. Verse 6, and said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. First, Notice again that little word, if. Satan again asking a question aimed at Jesus' identity. And second, notice that Satan here quotes scripture himself. Remember I told you Satan is intelligent. It may surprise you, but he's a great theologian. He knows scripture backwards and forwards, but he'll use it to twist and confuse. He has noticed that Jesus resisted his last temptation with scripture. So he fights fire with fire. He goes to Scripture himself. He's quoting from Psalm 91, verse 11, that says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. In other words, hey, Jesus, show off a little. Show me who you are. I mean, Scripture says he won't let you even stub your toe. So if you trust God so much, throw yourself down. Let him prove it. Let him prove how much he loves you. The first temptation was you can't trust God to give you bread, so you might as well make it yourself. The second temptation is test God. See if he'll do what he says he'll do. This is the sin of presuming on God. It's the sin of testing God. This is walking out in the traffic and asking God to keep you from getting hit by a truck. This is taking your paycheck to the casino and asking, daring God to pay your mortgage for you. This is having an affair and asking God to protect your children. But Jesus won't do that. Do it. He won't take the dare. In verse 7, we see his response. And again, he quotes from Deuteronomy, this time chapter 6. Jesus says, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, here's a question for you and for me. If you were put into a cage match, you and the tempter, you and Satan, just a cage match, and all you have from God's word, all you can draw upon is the portion of God's word that right now, as you sit here, is in your memory bank. That's all you have to go on to fight this battle. How would you do? How would you do? Would you be able to recognize the lie? Would you be able to counteract it with truth? Satan's not done yet, doesn't give up easy. He comes back a third time, and watch how this time he pulls out all the stops. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, and said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now, he takes Jesus to a very high place. We don't know exactly where this was. Maybe a site called Mount Arbel. Uh, it's got a panoramic view of the Sea of Galilee, surrounding regions. Many believe this to be the site where Jesus would have given the great commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, because it feels like you can see everything, you can see the whole world. Satan says, in effect, you can have everything you see if you just worship me. Just bend your knee for a moment. Now, there are two temptations here, actually. First one is quite obvious. Uh, that is to worship someone other than God the Father. He's tempting Jesus to worship something else. And all sin, again, almost all sin, is failure to worship God the Father. It's worshiping, putting anything else in the place of where God belongs, pleasure, money, success, relations, anything in that place will create sin in our lives. But there's a second, more subtle temptation here. He says, you can have all this. Well, hold on a second. How is that a temptation? Doesn't it already belong to Jesus? Doesn't everything already belong to him? I mean, this is Jesus, the eternal word of God, who was with God in the beginning, who is an agent of all creation. All of it already belongs to him. So what's Satan talking about? Satan doesn't own it, does he? Well, the Bible tells us Satan is the prince of this world for now. For now, he's been given limited authority. He's like a squatter on God's property. Okay? And he's offering it to Jesus if he'll just worship him. This is the temptation. You can have all this. You can have all the glory. And you can have it without going to the cross. That's the temptation. You can take a shortcut. 
I'll give you back everything that rightfully belongs to you. And I'll give it to you without any more battling, any more fighting. You won't have to go to the cross and do that whole suffering thing. I'll just give it to you. Just bend your knee. I'll just give it to you. Just skip that part of it. Verse 10, then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, be gone. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Okay, let's summarize Satan's strategy here. First, he questions Jesus' identity. If you are the Son of God. He questions identity. He questions that fundamental relationship of trust. Second, he questions the goodness of God. He tempts Jesus to take a shortcut because God's really not going to come through with bread. He's really not going to take care of him. Third, he tempts Jesus to test God, which is a form of pride. Throw yourself down. God will take care of you. You can get him to do anything you want because you're special, Jesus. And finally, he tempts Jesus to worship something other than God and to take a shortcut to glory. Shortcut. I'll give you everything without the suffering. Now, Satan's strategies really haven't changed since the story we're reading in Scripture. And here's what we have to understand. Temptation always begins with a lie. Always. Because before we're tempted to do something, we're tempted to believe something. Before we're tempted to do something, we're tempted to believe something that is not true about God. He won't take care of you. He won't come through in the end. You can't trust him. You can't trust his word. You'll never get what you're looking for unless you do this yourself. Temptation always begins with a lie. Secondly, temptation always makes sin look good. Always. Satan doesn't come to a man with big red horns and a pointy tail and say, hey, buddy, why don't you have an affair and destroy your marriage and family? That's not what he says. No, he comes like, a good, like an old friend, like a buddy from yesteryear and says, hey, I've noticed you've been working hard. You put in long hours. No one really appreciates you. I think you deserve a little more attention. I think you deserve a little more appreciation. You could use a little pleasure in your life. A little fun never hurt anyone. No one will really know. That's the tempter. Always makes sin look good. Thirdly, temptation always, almost always involves a shortcut. A shortcut to what God has already promised if we trust him. Jesus resists the tempter by recognizing the lie, by confronting the lie with the truth of God's word, by trusting in God's goodness, and by relying on the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Remember? The Spirit came on him at his baptism. The Spirit led him into the wilderness. And at the end of all of this, the Spirit and the angels of heaven were ministering to him. Jesus was never alone as he was being tempted. He was never alone. The Spirit was with him. And so the temptation that Satan intended for destruction actually becomes that which prepares Jesus for his life of ministry. He's being prepared. Which is why James says in James chapter 1, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials or temptations of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I believe this story is here in the Bible for two reasons. First, so that we will know a little more about who Jesus is. Secondly, because sooner or later, we will all find ourselves in the wilderness. All of us. Sooner or later, we'll face the circumstances uh, created by the tempter that cause us to question our faith, cause us to question God's care, that present opportunities to take shortcuts. It's just a shortcut here, just a shortcut there. And when we find ourselves in the wilderness, we need to know that Jesus has already been there. In Hebrews 4, Paul writes, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that may, we may receive mercy 
and find grace to help in time of need. Here's what that tells us. And here's what Jesus wants us to know. God is good. His word is true. He can be trusted and we are not alone. You are not alone in the wilderness. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads now with me for prayer.